This is the Tech Support Guy Show, episode 44, for Sunday, May 8th, 2011. Dan is as angry as a bird. Welcome to the Tech Support Guy Show. I am Mike Cermak, known on the site as Tech Guy, and with me today is my brother, Glenn Cermak. Hey. He's up in Harrisburg, and he is an educator in uh, at the Harrisburg Public Schools, and also is there, what are you, technical coordinator or something? Uh, technology integration facilitator. That's what I said. Uh, yeah. So he's the geek up there as well, so that's why he uh, fits right in <laughs> That's with what us. it means. And uh, an even bigger geek with us today is Dan McCarthy. Good afternoon. There you go. Dan, unfortunately, doesn't have video because despite being such a big geek, he does not have high-speed internet. See? <laughs> but you can get 4G. Much, much like other geeks, I'm a recluse, and I live in the middle of nowhere. But I do have 3G because cows and farmers now, definitely Do you have 3G or people. do you have 4G? Before the Sorry, show, you... 4G. Yeah, so 4G. wouldn't you be able to stream video out of there on your 4G? Why are we talking to you on your dial-up connection? Because it's not reliable. Oh, now you're getting all detailed. But dial-up yeah. is. <laughs> it's not really dial-up for anyone wondering. <laughs> it's I want you guys to stop picking on my gerbil. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, He <laughs> works very hard to maintain internet access out here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way all the connections are in Pennsylvania. Um, so, this is really the Pennsylvania podcast. All of us are in Pennsylvania. I'm used to having uh, Brian here to break things up a little bit. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys, for being with me. We're going to jump into a couple of interesting stories for those uh, watching and listening. Uh, first of all, let's go into the, one of the news stories that I think a couple people are interested in is the Samsung Infuse. I think Danny had sent me a link on that. But uh, so Samsung's new mobile device is out, and I guess that's an Android device. It is an Android device, and it uh, it's the largest. 4G, it's both, it has the largest screen and both the thinnest of the 4G devices out there. The largest and the thinnest. Interesting. So is it still going to fit in my pocket? Because the Android devices I've seen so far are ginormous. <laughs> it, I believe it will fit in your pocket. And it's, it's four and a half, in, it has a four and a half inch screen. Whoa. That's ginormous. Yeah. What are you doing with this thing? Watching porn. Oh, oh, I see. That's what the internet was developed for. That's why it's 4G. Hey, right. <laughs> I see. Now, now it's all <laughs> becoming clear. It has a uh, 1.2 gigahertz processor, which is faster than what it's being compared to on um, Verizon's network, which is a Droid Charge. And uh, to sweeten the pot for AT and T customers, it's coming with Angry Birds with a hidden level. Which, if you get to that hidden level, Samsung is offering prizes and whatnot. That's stupid. That well, is, that's it is worth stupid. it. So just I'm going right to buy there. this, you know, whatever expensive 4G new giant phone screen so I can play Angry Birds. Yeah. See, I well, on other know, phones, I, the birds see, are really tiny. Now, here's the thing: I wasn't interested in this phone <laughs> before, but now that there's a hidden level of Angry Birds, I'm totally going to get it. I get jokes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Get, I've never once actually ha have viewed the Angry Birds game. My wife did download it and was playing it the other day as we were driving somewhere. I, of course, was driving. Um, and, and I don't get it. Yeah, the I don't get I it either. People talk about the, this game and, you know, all of us fly a lot. We travel a lot. And I still don't get it. I would much rather read a book than... Play. There are a handful of games that I am addicted to, even on mobile devices, like the airplane landing game. I forget what it's called, air traffic controller thing. I like that. And maybe it's that's just the plane. You're a plane nerd. Well, see, yeah, I think that's even I addicting agree. to other people. Maybe not. Maybe it is a plane nerd thing. But yeah, the Angry yeah, Birds is. thing, I downloaded that. And even on the iPad, at least on the iPad, you could actually see what you're doing. I don't understand how you can play it on an iPhone. But it, it was amusing to me for about 20 minutes. And then I was like, all right, this is getting old. Kids yeah. at my school love that game. I don't get it. Our CEO uh, at my company loves that game. He gets on he gets on a plane, and as soon as they allow him to pull out his whatever Apple device he's using at the moment, uh, he, he's playing Angry Birds. I don't get it. And apparently, he's got some sick high high score on it too. Well, I told but you I, over I Easter about that guy that's using it in his classroom. 
You, oh, that's right. Tell us about that again. <laughs> yeah, he's actually letting his uh, students play Angry Birds. Uh, he has a smart board in front of the room, and um, he projects the iPad up onto the smart board, and they play Angry Birds. But before before they do each like you know pull of the bird in the slingshot thing, they have to you know map out like trajectory and all that sort of stuff, and then they pull it and see if it actually lands where they figured it would land. So you have to do some math in advance to make sure that you're actually going to shoot the bird where you think you're going to shoot the bird. Right. So I don't know. That seems a little lame to me. I I guess it depends on the actual implementation of how that goes through. In the yeah, I, I haven't actually seen it. but uh, It sounds yeah. to me like an instructor who really likes Angry Birds, who's looking for an <laughs> excuse to play Angry Birds in his class, yeah. Like Danny's CEO is hiding in his office there secretly playing Angry Birds. What is the educational value of playing Angry Birds? I, really? Well, what it's is... not the Angry Birds. It's figuring out the trajectory. Right. Because that's okay. part of the math standard. So he's just using Angry Birds to motivate the students to figure out the math problems. So then I propose, Glenn... Or at you're... least that's the argument. I, I'm not saying I'm agreeing it's with this. but application of the math. You're a history teacher, right? I am. Then I propose that you bring civilization into your classroom as a as a uh, learning tool. <laughs> that would be great. Yes. Or like Age of Empires or something like yeah, that. Exactly. Exactly. I'm I'm That'd not sure sweet. how historically accurate all of those games are. It, it doesn't have to be. No, see that that's why I'm a history teacher. It's great because especially since I teach ancient history, the records are so messed up. Like, you know, you have five different birth dates for one person. I, so, I mean, you can make an argument for anything. <laughs> and that was exactly my point as far as using games in the uh, in education. I, I Anyway, we're off topic. The Samsung Infuse is out. I want one. Mikey, will you buy me one? No. Moving on. <laughs> So is there anything else interesting about this phone other than the fact that it's gigantic and there is an Angry Birds level on it for some dumb reason? Uh, it's got a standard 8 megapixel camera on the front, 1.3 on the back. That's kind of cool. It's kind of iPhone-like. Yep. Uh, that's really it. I mean, it uses the standard Samsung interfaces. doesn't really have anything incredibly special except that it's the first AT&T AT &T phone to allow... Um, to actually have a checkbox to allow applications outside of the market. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. So is that going to be standard on Android devices now? I don't know if it's going to be standard on Android devices, but the implications of this are that you can use the Amazon App Store to... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, on my Droid, I've had that checkbox since I bought it 18 months ago. Right. AT&T has been notorious for disabling the Android capabilities of your Android phone. Which is why my phone is rooted. <laughs> All right, that's interesting. Whenever you get one, Danny, I'll play with it. I'll play Angry Birds until I find the secret level. As long as it doesn't <laughs> take me more than 20 minutes. <laughs> as long as you map out the traje trajectories right, uh, it shouldn't take you that long. Right. All right, so, Dan, you had another one for us here. I remember a couple of years ago, the big thing was going to be the hundred dollar PC for uh, for yeah, third third world countries, and I'm trying to remember the details of it. They're trying to get a PC that was going to be under a hundred dollars. I remember there was a deal where you could buy one, and then they would donate one overseas. It's called one laptop per child, and it's still going. Um, in fact, you'll you you may see commercials. Anyone who's interested can go to YouTube. There are, there are actually commercials where I believe it's a serial uh, manufacturer. There, you can win one uh, as part of, you know, like the prize inside uh, of a box of cereal. And when you win one, another child in a third world country would get one. And it was supposed to be a $100 device. And when the when the device came out, it was much more than $100 because you had to buy one for another child in order to get your hands on one. It was a really neat device, really neat idea. It had uh, a little crank to generate power on it. It looks like, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen kind of the VTech. Mm -hmm. um, toy computers. Toy, toy computers for children. It looks a lot like that, but it's supposed to be fairly rugged. 
right yeah i actually got to play with one at ted uh, a year or two ago and uh and it was pretty cool i mean it runs a linux based uh os of some kind i forget exactly what it was on there um but uh, and one thing that i thought was pretty cool was the mesh networking that it had so yeah. that it doesn't have to connect directly to an access point in order to connect to the internet if you have one device connected to the internet somewhere then it acts almost like a repeater and right. will add you know so if you had a village that had an internet connection then all over the village as long as you have one pc in range and then another pc in range of that pc and then another pc in range of that pc it'll extend the the size of that network indefinitely and this uh, the one laptop per child if i remember correctly was really focused on third world countries specifically within africa yeah, I think if I recall, I don't, I don't want to speak out turn, but I think they they had deals to do it in a lot of different uh, countries, uh, even some of the Middle East, and some of those deals fell through at the end. And I don't remember what all. Mm -hmm. Here's Paraguay and India and Madagascar and Nepal and Gaza and yep. Kenya and Afghanistan and Peru and Uruguay. They're using Uruguay, as their yep. uh, they're using yep. as their uh, samples, and that's at laptop.org. And I'll put that in the show notes. And again, for those listening or watching, show notes are go always go up at techguy.tv a couple of days after we finish the show, so you can go there and find links to anything we talk about. But this so, is laptop.org. One laptop per child was um, sponsored by uh, MIT. the uh, The device we're talking about today, which is called Raspberry Pi, is um, from a game developer. And it was Roller Coaster Tycoon game developer David Braben. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, this device differs greatly from one laptop per child. It is a it is a computer on a stick. So a, a lot of us geeks, we we will carry around a bootable um, Linux distro on a USB stick. Sure, if you're and a big nerd. Right, and it's much like that, <laughs> except that it has <laughs> an HDMI port. It has a USB 2.0 port, and I believe it has an audio port as well. So it, in the um, links that I've provided for you, you'll see that this is really not much bigger than a silver dollar. The prototype is disgustingly ug ugly right now, so we're certainly not expecting to see anything in stores for a while. But it is HDMI out on a basically a USB stick. It has an SD card. It's running Ubuntu, uh, has KOffice and Python installed. It's pretty amazing. It, the, the specs for this are 700 megahertz ARM processor, 128 megs of SD RAM. It's running OpenGL, um, composite and HDMI out, USB 2.0, and you have your, just use your SD card for additional storage. Now, if that 700 megahertz processor were able to, uh, to to run actual graphics out, think about this as your set-top box and connecting a USB hub to it for your external storage. Wow. The only thing I don't see mention of on here is what networking is used. Well, and if you look at the um, picture there that has the screen, it seems to me that they have the little device there right in front of the monitor, and it, the, through that USB connection, I think they have a USB NIC plugged in. Yeah, that's a D-Link USB NIC. I, I, I recognize the branding on that. And it's, right. it's, it, it's interesting to point out here that I believe the D-Link uh, USB NIC here is quite a bit larger than the PC that it is operating. <laughs> I would say easily... Yeah, easily eight times bigger, you know, if you figure, you know, width and, and length. Yeah, so that's I'm kind of interesting. I'm imagining devices like this. So the, the target audience for this device are also third world countries, specifically children learning programming. Um, I'm thinking of devices like this in, um, you know, big brother, big sister type of organizations. Think how cheap it is and how easy it is to just flash it over so that if something were to happen, somebody corrupted the installation of Linux. I mean, it doesn't matter. So here's does. the problem with this. A couple of problems. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? Let's, let's, let's hear the problem. All right. Problem number one, it's Linux. No, I'm kidding. That's a joke. Um, problem number one is what is with this guy's website? I agree with you there. His website is the most horrible website. I, he needs to hire someone 
that has it is I, 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 I I would have thought it was a joke. It's ridiculous. It has you know three lines of text and two pictures and an email link. I mean, there's nothing going on here. I don't. So whatever. That's that's ridiculous. So I don't know what their plan is with this or what they're they're really going to do with it, if anything. But the other problem with it is that yeah, you got this twenty five dollar device supposedly, assuming mass produced. The, then you also need to get a NIC for it. Then you also need a keyboard. Then you also need a mouse. Then you also need a power supply. Then you also need a monitor. Uh, I don't think. Do you need it? Where is the power supply on that picture? Do we see one? Um, I see a power adapter of some kind on the right there. I think. Where did it go? Well, unless it's so, just a USB hub. Yeah, that's a USB hub. I think that thing might be getting powered through that USB hub on the right. Interesting. Yeah. So. I'm okay with all of that. But what I am suggesting is that that is no longer twenty five dollars. Okay, I, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I so mean, I mean, I didn't go to Angry Birds Math School, but according to my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a funny, funny man. <laughs> So, I mean, you get the monitor alone there. How much is a monitor, even if it's a small one? Well, let, let me show you, let me show you something right? that is uh, a, a lot like uh, this $25 device. I'm going to get the link here, go back to the chat room. This device is called Trim Slice. Trim Slice? Yep. Check it out. <laughs> oh, Danny, you cracked me up. Yeah, it, it's. I'm sure there are no puns behind that name whatsoever. All right, trimslice.com for those playing along at home. All right, so what is this? 0. 0.6 inches thin, not thick. 0. 0.6 inches thin. Aren't they aren't they smart there? What the heck am I looking at? I don't even understand what I'm looking at. You were looking at basically like a device that's the size of a, a USB hub. Okay. Uh it is a it's a full-blown computer. It's an ARM-based, no fan, it's quiet. It's uh, got NVIDIA Tegra in, inside at 1 gigahertz. It's got 1 gig of RAM on it. I believe the RAM may be upgradable to uh, to 2. It's got digital video out. It's got your USB ports for expansion. Um, 5.1 surround sound. All right, now this looks interesting. A couple things to point out here. It's got you know, a couple USB ports, micro, normal USB, SD slot, RS-232, who the heck uses that anymore, uh, wireless LAN built into it, gigabit, Ethernet built into it, uh, DVI out built into it, HDMI built into it. Now, this looks like an actual device. Yep. And this looks like an actual website. It even has a purchase button on it. So this <laughs> might be like half legit. Yep. And there, there are varying versions of this device. Um, and you'll notice if you if you go to... The uh, purchase that they're currently out of order. Ah, so how much what, are these things? Two to three hundred dollars. All right. So once again, that is more than twenty-five dollars. That is definitely more. But see, <laughs> I, I, I saw that twenty-five dollar, um, twenty-five dollar computer, and I thought, well, I've got all of the peripherals for it already. Right. So I could right now. I'm using one of the um, one of the Acer Slimline machines. For my uh, media room, sure. And with with that twenty five dollar PC, which is a USB stick with a USB hub and with a uh, USB Ethernet, I can hide all of that a lot easier. Those individual components than I can all of the stuff I have connected right now to sure my Acer. So I, I like the idea of that, but the trim slice actually fits more directly with what I would use it for. So what is their plan? What would you use this trim slice gadget do doohickey for? You would take it into classrooms and you would use it for specifically teaching programming to children is what uh, Raven's web website states. Well, I guess the real question then, if you're going to use it in a classroom, is first of all, it's two to three hundred dollars plus the monitor, plus the keyboard, plus the mouse. You the already got a nick into it though. Wait, hold on just a second. Well, are we talking about the trim slice or the Raspberry Pi? The trim slice. The trim slice is just, uh, I, I don't actually know what it was intended to be used for. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let's no. see. Well, the real so, question, if you're going to use it for educational purposes, is can you play Angry Birds on it? See, 
I'm gonna get off the podcast now. <laughs> was, was that somebody playing Angry Birds in the it background? It sounded like it. I'm... Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm I'm done with the Angry Birds. I'm about to become. A, I'm I'm a, I'm about to give you an Angry Bird. <laughs> hey, wait for it. It's, it's coming in the chat. It's Look a good that. thing that uh, it's a good thing that we don't have video on Danny right now. Yeah. Well, I, I put it in the chat. See, take a look. I'm gonna have yeah, to. I'm gonna have to ban you from the chat. Hang on. Let me. No, I don't see it in the chat. What but it took him about? so long to get in there. I'm looking. I'm looking in the chat, but I don't see it. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? How old are you? Um, uh, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> are we talking to maturity level or actual age? Uh, yeah, let me. Where's my here? Timeout. There you go. Now you're on oh, timeout. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving along. That's a good pair. All right. So that's yeah. Danny. <laughs> You go sit in the timeout chair, Danny. Whenever you want to say you're sorry, you can come back and play Angry Birds. I'm not sorry. I'm not saying I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. So we have to do a parenting podcast sometime. Absolutely. There has to be a digital way of doing a timeout. Some way that you can, you know, put a limit on their on their Apple device so that they can not play Angry Birds for a period of time. You know, believe it or not, we limit our our children's. Use of technology, games, computers, sure. and television. I mean, we limit it greatly. You, you must be children. You must play. You must, you must learn. Uh, if you want to go to pbskids.org, you can have an hour there. But, uh, we don't allow our children to use technology nearly as much as I did when I was a child. With my, that, you know, want them eight. to turn out like you did? Exactly. I don't. <laughs> Isn't it the role of parents to make sure that their children are better people than they are? Yes, that is the goal. Hey, Glenn, if you had a device like this, would you actually use it in your um, in your classroom or other classrooms within your district? If I had a device, well, like which one? Like the $25 computer. Now, I remember you and I had talked about, uh, what was it? Uh, well, the thin client using Ubuntu. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and and I do, I still have a few in my room. Um, yeah, I I could definitely see it being used by schools. I mean, e- yeah, the twenty five dollar claim is a little misleading, but um, oh, am I still there? You're still there. You're still here. Okay, my my little camera light just flashed. Um. The $25 claim is a little misleading, but it's still a whole lot cheaper than what schools are paying now. That's true. That's true. Well, and especially... And for a school, most of... I mean, you couldn't put in the tech ed labs where you need to have AutoCAD and stuff like that running. Absolutely not. But you could put it in the library, the computer lab, the business labs. 90% of the applications, it'll do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you're actually... You're you're doing yourself a favor if you put this in instead of a full-blown desktop. If you think about it, because a full-blown desktop gives the the user the capability to do to use the computer for something other than what it was intended for. So, if you're specifically looking to teach programming to children, then a device that is well has an operating system that is able to multitask very well. You the the processing power behind it is not enough for you to go and play you know flash animations or. Um, watch videos on YouTube. I mean, you're, you're limiting the capability there. Plus, it runs Linux, which is just cool. <laughs> I, I definitely think. I mean, schools already have to buy the, the monitor, the keyboard, the mouse, all that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this... it comes together as a package, right. but it, it's still going to be cheaper. Well, and the other argument that can be made there is that you could get, uh, you know, use keyboard, mouse, and monitor in many cases and just plug them into this thing. Sure. I will donate I will donate at least 10 right now. Exactly, right. So, anyhow. All right, that's kind of interesting. So, the the question then becomes, look at check out this check out this uh this this transition. Are you ready for this? So, instead of spending this 2 or 300 dollars for a computer all told, 
why not just get an iPad? How was uh, that? How was that transition? Do you like that? That was, that, that was nice. I have no need for feminine products. Oh, har 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 har. Have you seen that um, <laughs> um, Saturday Night Live thing on iPads? I they have did, now. Like, a couple of years before the iPad was actually announced, they did a skit about iPads as a feminine product. It was pretty funny. Anyhow, nope, I, I must have missed that one. It's just kind of funny how they foresaw that come. You know, kind of. <laughs> it was years. Before. And you would, you you would think after that Apple wouldn't name it an iPad. You would think so. well. You would think even without that Apple Apple wouldn't have named it an iPad. But that's neither here nor there. So the real question is, uh, iPads are off, obviously an awesome device and can play Angry Birds and therefore should be in the classroom. Obviously. Okay. So there's no disagreement and, and we can just move on. I, I, I had <laughs> um, several iPads in my classroom this year. And uh, we just had a technology committee meeting for our district uh, about two weeks ago. And... Uh, I had been one of the three teachers in the district to pilot these iPads in the classroom, figure out all the different uses for them and all that, and whether it's worth it. And it's not. So how the, come? What, what was wrong with using an iPad in the classroom? It seems well, like it see, would make I, sense. iPads are great for interactivity, for displaying content, things like that. Right. But in order to gauge if students are learning, you need to have input. Right. You need to have some way for them to give responses so you can gauge their understanding. And the iPad is absolutely horrible for input. Um, I guess, I, I guess why don't you just if you have a development team behind it, or perhaps there are already um, apps out there for that, but um, quiz based applications that go directly to your district server or to your computer specifically, maybe even your feminine product. Um, that would allow you to get the, get the immediate, now granted it would take some development, but I'm sure that you can find somebody out there that would be interested in doing development like that. Well, uh, smart technologies already has, uh, I use student response remotes in the classroom sometimes. Okay. Um, you know, like multiple choice, true, false, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And, um, they're handheld remotes that each kid has. And they actually came out with a smart response VE virtual edition and any internet enabled device can answer the same sets of questions, things like that, and you get the same reports. Hmm, including the iPad, I guess. Right. Okay. But still, a set of 32 response remotes costs maybe $1,500. Right. You can get three iPads. Yeah, but, but, I, but a response remote isn't nearly as cool as an iPad. And a response remote can't play Angry Birds. <laughs> No, I mean, cannot. Just, getting this. That's it. That's it. One more Angry Birds <laughs> comment. I am out of here. So I'm pretty sure Angry Birds has to be in the title oh. of this. Oh, I think <laughs> yeah. we might have the title already. That's awesome. <laughs> Danny's Angry Birds. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you how much I hate birds. <laughs> it, it could just be Danny is as angry as a bird. Oh, there we, there we I kind of like that. There we go. Um, but anyway, so back on topic. Um. I mean, no, it's not nearly as cool. But when you're spending taxpayer money, I'm with you. I'm with you. Functional, uh, functional, yes, and they, they would both serve the same. If they both serve the same purpose, yep. No one isn't as pretty or as flashy, or you know, you, you can't touch it. But it just. <laughs> It doesn't make sense to me. And I, I'm yet to find an app on the iPad that I would use instructionally that there isn't something either exactly the same or comparable that I can just have on my PC projected onto yeah. the smartboard. <clears throat> I can see how it would be nothing more than a distraction, quite honestly. Uh, I, I can say that some of the teachers that piloted this... Um, they're special education teachers, and they found it to be very beneficial. Um, like in the autistic support classroom, they found it very beneficial. I, I think but, it could also be beneficial for younger learners as well. So you're in high school, right, or junior high? Uh, middle school, yeah, seventh grade. So I'm thinking for for children, you know, ages maybe six to ten. It, mm -hmm. it, 
it gets their attention a little better than sure. somebody dictating to them. Right. Well, with, with no it, well and th they are very useful in terms of like creating things. Like, um, I did a project where they created like a photo story. I did a project okay. where they made their own podcast, mm. and they can do all of that on the iPad. Sure, that's perfect device for that. Yeah. But and the other but thing is, what... the, the only my, my argument was, well, why are we going to buy one iPad when we can buy two netbooks for less money? Agreed. Well, and then you have a keyboard. You can have. Then you I can mean, actually use it for uh, to produce. It, it it's a real content computing device, not some mass marketed toy gimmick. Well, yeah. the other thing I was going to say is they do have apps out there like the um, the Elements app and things like that that are kind of interactive for learning. I mean, there well, are but interactive... There's, inter there's interactive websites for yeah, those. Yeah, things. but they're not yeah. cool. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if it's something you can get their attention with and, and get the kids to, to pay attention to it and to think about it and, and actually stay awake during class, I think there's some value in that. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm not which arguing is, that it absolutely grabs their attention. Which is but... why you would play Angry Birds in the classroom just to oh, catch their geez, attention. That's, that's it. <laughs> that was a legitimate but comment. It... That wasn't that wasn't just play. All right, so I actually like Glenn's point and, and commend him for it. That you you can get tech, the same technology cheaper. Right. That actually, that I think isn't... even better technology. I think a netbook yeah. is a much better investment. And lets you yep. do much more things than an iPad. Especially and there are the actually very on. cheap Android tablets out there. Um, right, absolutely. If you if you have to go tablet route for yep. maybe those special education rooms where they're more hands on. That's right. Absolutely. Just buy a buy a Nook collar. It's an Android tablet. Sure it is. All right, well, so we're not going to use iPads in education. No, we probably will, but we shouldn't. Okay. We're it's a waste of money. So instead, right. we ought to use them in hospitals. Now, this I can't disagree with. <laughs> you no, you I, can I found it very interesting. I, I was actually forwarded this article by uh, a friend of mine that lives in Canada um, who... I met when I was up working with Smart Technologies last summer, um, and she lives in Ottawa and emailed this to me. Um, Ottawa's hospital is going all iPad. Yes. All medical records will be on iPads. Doctors will carry iPads around, and there's video clips like on YouTube and stuff, like news reports um, about this. And the doctor that you know headed the effort to start this. You know, he has an iPad in his, like, lab coat pocket that he carries around, and it lists all of his patients, and he touches on the patient, and it gives him the medical record that they filled out when they came. It gives him copies of the, uh, you know, like, he has all the x-rays right on there, and he can show it to the patient and zoom in on different parts of the x-ray and circle things and annotate on it, and then he can save it. Google for and the then symptoms. That <laughs> night. <laughs> what they are. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> And then that night, you know, whoever the doctor is for the next shift can just pull their iPad out and has all of the other doctor's notes, has all of the images, has everything right there instead of having to, you know, find a chart, you know, like look at the chart at the bottom of the bed and then go to radiology to pull the x-ray out. Well, now you're comparing... So everything is in one place. You're, you're really just comparing e EMR, electronic medical records in general, not iPad specifically there. Right. Because well, right. most hospitals already have gone to electronic medical records and they just sit down at the computer in the room to get that information. Right. And now they well, carry it. But most wherever. of the electronic medical records are text only. Right. Okay. They, don't, so, they don't have copies of all the images and the MRIs and all of that stuff. And um, another one of, the, one of the other clips showed, you know, I don't know what app it was, but, you know, it was a 3D diagram of the body and he could rotate it and zoom in and remove the skeletal system to focus on a certain organ and show things like that to the patient before a procedure. Patient education. Yeah, I, I can definitely see this being used. Uh, I'd be interested to read what they've done security wise to make sure that uh, the apps that they're using require the, the appropriate authentication, 
how the doctors sure. feel about having to log in to the application every time they're going somewhere because an application with sensitive data like that, you, you have to require a, a very small timeout window. Otherwise, if the doctor leaves it in his lab coat and the lab coat is left in the, uh, you know, locker room or whatever and somebody else gets their hands on it that shouldn't necessarily have access to it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I could see that happening very easily just yeah. going from room to room. He's in one room working with a patient, sets the iPad down for a second, walks out of the room, forgets about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah definitely have to log in each time. So that would be a hassle. As far as the, the security, I don't think, the, I mean, the actual data security encryption, I don't think that's a big problem because none of that data is really going to be stored on the iPad anyway. It's going to be pulled So you're not going right. to use the iPad's camera, the iPad 2's new camera to take pictures of patients physical manifestation of symptoms? Mm -hmm. I guess you could, but even if you did that, I wouldn't save it on the iPad. I would transmit it wirelessly over to the EMR system. I would right. expect the same thing, but are the applications actually configured to, to do the same yeah, thing? Yeah, right. You just have to right. make sure of that. Right. I was talking to an IT, this is kind of unrelated, but I was talking to an IT director of a hospital, and he was uh, explaining to me some of the difficulties they were having. One of the biggest problems they had as far as security is that doctors, you know, with their own private offices within the hospital or within the hospital's, you know, facilities would plug in their own wireless router so that they could have their, you know, computer or whatever wirelessly connected to the Internet and would not secure them. So I'm going to make a smart <laughs> point right here. I'm surprised the doctors are actually capable of doing that. <laughs> well, you know, honestly, plugging in a wireless router and not configuring it is not that difficult. Yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> I mean, that is true. So they have to make it a regular event to walk through the hospital facilities and do Wi-Fi searches and sniff out these unsecured wireless access points. Uh, you know, every couple, you know, every week or so, I think that they they yeah. were doing it on a regular basis, going through and picking out these wireless access points that are connected to the hospital's network. So <laughs> I mean, the so the point here is that no matter how smart you make the technology, there's still going to be dumb people uh, that sure. will break the loop. Sure. Anyhow, yeah, that's interesting though. So, so this hospital in in Canada ordered eighteen hundred of these iPads. I think it's pretty cool. I could see it used. The other use uh, in the chat room, you curl points out, real estate is a perfect use for it. That you can show pictures of a house, sign documents. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually when I uh, refinanced my house. Uh, the the lady who came to my office to do the closing on it, she was using her Android phone to actually take pictures of my license and uh -huh. all the other documentation that was required. So I can yeah. definitely see the uh, the iPad being used for the same, only a little bit. You've got a much bigger screen and um, full document size, things like that. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, they, there are some apps out there for the iPad and iPhone for searching for real estate that I've used. Uh, we've been looking for commercial real estate, just as you know, Danny got a place in Hagerstown, but there's some neat things where they'll give you a like Google map of things, just like you can do it on the web as well. But the interface using a, a touch device is so much sweeter just to sweep around and move and yeah. zoom in and click on one and, you know, flip through the pictures and click on another. And I mean, it's kind yeah. of a neat, I don't know. It's, it's a, a, a virtual experience. tour. Yeah. A virtual tour. Right. Right. Interact virtual tour. Unlike, you know, the, I mean, th this uh, this makes the the realtors taking the pictures or anyone supporting them, uh, it makes their jobs a little more difficult up front. They've got to one develop an app that's a little bit better than the flash animation that takes you room from room. That but you know some 3D modeling that you can actually look up at the ceiling in a room, truly get your 360 degree view of the room. That would be really awesome mm -hmm. in a real estate application for, and then using your finger, like you said, to move around the room. Sure. Hell, walking across the uh, the floor into the next room, things like that. That would be that would be a very very nice feature. Anybody? Yeah. I'm that that it. would be pretty cool. I mean, right now, whenever whenever you guys are are shopping for for a house, I mean, if there's not good pictures of that building on there, I don't even look at it. Exact. It is nope. so critical. Yep. I mean, it is so critical. Yep. I, you, you can list that, that it's brand new construction, and I won't look at it. Right. I agree. you got to have pictures. And, and I think that seeing all those pictures laid out nicely on a map of the city is pretty cool, yeah. too. Because you can look at it and say, oh, that's over on the west side. It doesn't matter yeah. what that building looks like. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, you can, you know, you know what I'm saying? You, you know where you want to be. You can be like, oh, man, that's a mile outside of Chambersburg where there's no cell service. You don't want to be there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so, um, so yeah, I think that there's a lot of other applications. I'm trying to think of what other would, things would be really good, obvious applications for mass use of the iPad. I'm sure there's many people who've done. I, I haven't been impressed with the ability to write on an iPad. Yeah, me neither. I've tried a I've couple done. different applications. In fact, I even have one of these fancy um, pen or, or stylus things designed for yeah. iPad uh, and not I, I've tried several of them and I, I can't find any, unless you write very large. Right. It's no different on an Android phone I, or Android tablet either. The, all, of, all of the ones I've used, they've been I more mean, irritating I've than they are helpful. It's really like I, I mean, obviously, I, I'm looking at it from an education aspect, but there are people that, uh, yeah, I think I have that same stylus actually. Um, <laughs> there, there are people that are saying they're going to use, you know, their iPad as like a wireless slate for their computer and projector in their room. Just connect to the computer remotely using. Uh, there's lots of different apps that let you connect to computers remotely. I use Splashtop, but there's lots of different ones. Um, but if I can't annotate on the screen, then it's... I would rather just buy a slate. Yep. Slates are way cheaper, and I mean, no, with most of the slates, you can't actually see the screen on the slate. You have to be writing on the slate, looking at the screen in front of you, but I mean, if you play enough video games, you have good hand-eye coordination. <laughs> Yeah, but well, I, I think that's one thing that Apple really needs to look into for, you know, the iPad three or whatever. Or put a darn keyboard on it and make it a netbook. There you go. Well, and they have those. I'm sure you guys have seen it. They have those um, Apple. The dock. Uh, yeah, they're not Apple actually, but that well, <laughs> Apple does have a Bluetooth keyboard available. But I'm thinking of the um, the uh, case for the iPads that have the built-in mm -hmm. keyboard. Mm -hmm. That's right. kind of cool. Because then you yeah. can pay, you know, like two or three times more than a netbook and get a netbook. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like my... But it my, has the Apple uh, logo on it. That's true. I, you know, I, I'm jesting. I do love my iPad, and I use it way too much. And other feminine products. Yes. yes. And now, <laughs> if you keep playing with that joke, I'm going to go back to the Angry Birds jokes. <laughs> I'll do it. Don't think I won't. <laughs> So anyhow, it's it's definitely more a consumption device. I mean, just sitting there trying to send out a short email is painful. It's it's not designed for. I agree. So, so you think it's easier to send out an email on your phone? Oh yeah, but well, my, I I have the Palm, the best multitasking phone there is out there, and it has a keyboard on it. I can send out a message on that thing five times faster than I can on the hey, freaking iPad. Real quick, how do you feel about HP buying that? Uh, I don't mind it, um, and I am super excited that the new devices are coming out. Um, I'm glad you brought this up. I should have mentioned this. So I got an announcement just uh, very recently in the last couple of days that um, the Veer, the HP Palm Veer, is going to be coming out on the 15th, I believe. And then later this summer, the new Palm Pre is supposed to be coming out. So I am definitely holding off for the Palm Pre. The Veer is the little baby version of it. Uh, it is tiny, um, but it's you know fits in your pocket kind of idea. But, I'm sure that you and the other three users of uh, hey, of the team listen, are, uh, very excited. listen here. The three of us get together and have support meetings, and we don't allow any Apple products. One of our vice presidents has a pre, and he loves it. But uh, his his family, you know, his four sons and his wife, they all use uh, Android based phones and make fun of him relentlessly. I love it. There's what are no... the odds of two of the three users of Palms being in Pennsylvania? Yeah, right. right. Well, he's actually in Maryland, so uh, you know. Oh, okay. We are right. all up and down the east Your coast. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is no comparison to multitasking <laughs> on the Palm device, and I love that. Um, it certainly has some drawbacks, not the least of which is the lack of apps. But and HP runs it now. Well, I'm hoping that that'll help improve the the. Uh, lack of apps. I'm hoping HP will throw some developers in on it and, and do some things to try and get some interest, but we shall see. And especially now that they're coming out with the new devices. So I'm going to put up on the, the podcast here, they're, they're advertising it here that the web OS is now available in small, medium, and large. 
the marketing guys were smoking something. But so they're showing the picture <laughs> here of the Veer, the small phone. And then the next one up is the Pre. The Pre 3 is shown here. And then the next one up is the HP touchpad, which looks suspiciously like an iPad. More me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But And Palm had talked about this as well. Whenever they first brought out the WebOS, they said they were going to use it for other products and kind of implied it was just going to be, a, you know, everyone expected a netbook or a tablet, especially a tablet. And so it's no surprise that this this is the case. So anyhow, it right. looks cool. But And there's some neat things you can do with it. It will, um, you know, you can touch the Palm Pre to the touchpad. and It'll send information back and forth. And you can, you know, do multitasking and switch an application from one to the other. And they have some neat things into it, some gimmicky things. But... Time will tell. Yes. Yes, indeed. If nothing else, it's good to have some more competition. Right. Well, yeah, it is. See, it is. the other problem is that I don't... Well, let me check here. I, I'm not sure that Angry Birds is available on Palm Pre. Mm, that, that is a concern. It is available on Android. Oh, oh I stand corrected. Absolutely. August 24th, the Angry Birds have landed. They are available on Palm Pre. All right. So All right, it is, guys, I'm going to go install the ceiling fan in my uh, living room. <laughs> it is <laughs> Angry Birds fan. <laughs> but the birds might hit the ceiling fan. Uh, Anyhow, so it's, it's, it is a real official device then, is, is my point. <laughs> Any device that can run Angry Birds is an actual consumer device. So <laughs> just, I mean, the truth is the truth. All right. Well, I think that that's about a wrap before Danny, you know, throws himself off a building. Um, anything else you guys wanted to make sure we hit that I missed somehow? No, sir. Oh, thanks. Um, I want to make a note here. Uh, Palm Pre 3 and Veer and Touchpad. Such a generic name, that. The Palm yes. Touchpad. Like, really? I guess it's better yeah. than iPad, but... Um, Alrighty, so I've got my notes together here. I'll be posting that up on TechGuy.tv in the next couple of days, as well as this episode. You can go to TechGuy.tv to see previous episodes, download the video, download the MP3, go to iTunes. You can subscribe to us there. That way your computer will automatically download the most recent version. At iTunes, you or in iTunes, you can choose to subscribe either to the video version or to the uh, audio version. So you have your choice. I would recommend not watching the video version while driving down the road. But uh, if you're sitting in an airplane and not operating the airplane, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's about it. So, um, techguy.org, techguy.tv. And uh, Glenn, let me bring you up here. Where can people find out more about you and uh, and what you're up to? Uh, probably the best is Twitter. I am Glenn Cermak on Twitter. Great. Um, and Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, Cermak, C-E-R-M-A-K, Glenn Cermak on Twitter. And he sends uh, educational things and uh, ed uh, technology and education, that sort of thing. So that's a good place to, to check I'm out. I'm glad you can spell the last name. Yeah, it took me some time to practice that, but uh, but I got it down. The pronunciation is still what gets me once in a while. Yeah, I can see that. And Danny, where can people find out more about you? In the uh, Tech Guy forums. Twitter and Identica, you can find me as Linux File, and I also have LinuxFile.org. That's L I N U X P H I L E. Right on. All right, guys, thank you very much. Happy Mother's Day, by the way, to all of those mothers listening. And uh, for those geeks listening live, don't forget it's Mother's Day. <laughs> and if you're listening to this recorded on Monday, you're out of luck and you're in big trouble. <laughs> All right, guys, have a good one. I'll see you next time. Bye now. Thanks. <laughs>